Good morning. It is 4.30 a.m. The last five days have been absolutely insane. So on Wednesday night, or I guess Thursday morning, I got food poisoning, and my stomach hasn't been the same since. Six straight hours of vomiting and diarrhea, I know, TMI, and it like completely changed me. I don't mean like psychologically, I just mean like my mood was super different, like the days following, I just didn't feel myself, I was super lethargic, my body just felt weird, it was really bizarre. It wasn't until I started drinking a kefir, which is a very probiotic rich dairy drink, yesterday that I actually started feeling like more balanced, more myself, just a weird string of days. I wouldn't say I fell into a depression, that sounds a little too dramatic, but my mood was really, really weird, like really weird. And it just goes to show me just how important your gut health is. I know food poisoning is sort of like on the far end of the spectrum of extreme, like it doesn't happen that often, but how it changed my stomach and my gut and my whole entire body was wild. So it's good to be back to somewhat normal. The last two days have been just absolute junk food 24 seven. My daughter had a party on Saturday and then we had the Super Bowl yesterday. I didn't go hog wild, but it definitely made my eating choices a little bit more challenging. So anyway, we're back at it. It's again, 4.30 on a Monday. Let's get after it. We're doing upper body today. I haven't done upper body in almost a week just because I've been hitting legs. It just seems to fall in the rotation a little bit more specifically. That doesn't seem right. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Hey. Oh. Today we're gonna be doing something called guillotine press. I don't think I've ever intentionally done these before. So we're gonna give it a shot. It's basically where instead of lowering it towards the nipple area of your chest, you lower it more towards your neck. And the idea is, is that you're getting a deeper stretch in the chest. So we're gonna give it a shot with some lighter weight, which means I'm gonna have to be way further forward. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, I feel that stretch. I can feel that way more in my chest. I definitely like that one. I wouldn't say more than chest press, but if I feel like I feel it more in my chest. So I definitely like that. So yesterday was a Super Bowl. Really wasn't interested in either team winning. But you know what was more fun was just all the stuff that was going on at my house, like all the people that were hanging out and chilling. The one thing I can't stop thinking about from the Super Bowl though is the way that uh, Travis Kelsey reacted to Andy Reid, like bumping into him and yelling at him. I can understand getting like passionate as a athlete myself and like getting fired up and, you know, like yelling and you know, all that kind of stuff. I, one, I don't think I'd ever do it to my coach. Uh, two, bumping into him was uncalled for. And I just feel like that's a whole different level of disrespect. Like I wouldn't bump into my boss at work and start yelling at him, you know? I feel like there's a certain level of maturity that you need to have. And that was very childish of him. And I think Travis Kelsey's a great player. I think off the field, like his podcast is really entertaining. I'm not a big fan of him as a person, but as like just an entertainer, he's okay. But I wouldn't consider him a role model at all. His brother though is a role model, Jason Kelsey. That dude is a stand up person. And if you know the story about Travis Kelsey, you know that the only reason Travis Kelsey is even an NFL player is because of his brother. Um, go look that up. It's a very interesting story. And I get it, you know, people aren't, not everyone is, no. You know what, I'm not even gonna give him any credit. It's all Jason Kelsey's credit. Travis Kelsey is a child. Yeah, he's a child. And Jason is a stand-up, actual human, human being. He's a real man. Travis Kelsey is a teenager who just grew up into a large body. Also, Travis Kelsey and, and Taylor Swift's relationship feels like a PR stunt. Like when you see them interact in like a lovey-dovey way, it doesn't give off like, I love you vibes at all. It very much gives off like, hey, I'm acting. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a hater. I, I don't hate either of them. I think they're, they're, they're fine. I think Taylor Swift's great. You know, music's awesome, but I just feel like a PR stunt. And her marketing team is amazing. As a marketer myself, like I would take everything out of her playbook, but this entire thing, this relationship doesn't feel real. All right, enough talking about pop culture bullshit. Let's get back to the next guillotine press. We'll do fire mood. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm a big fan of Mike Isertel's philosophy that slow eccentrics is one of the most important things other than range of motion to the point where I rather have a slow eccentric motion. For those that don't know, eccentric just means like on a bench press, the downward motion, on a squat, the downward motion, on a deadlift, the downward motion, instead of the pushing motion, that should be slow. And the reason why I think that's so important is because 
One, you're literally building muscle by controlling the weight going down. Like it's a huge benefit. The other thing is, is that so many people either completely neglect it or they don't realize just how important it is. And I see lots of people in gyms and, and working out who don't really think about that. And it's, I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm not saying like they should know better. That's why I'm talking about it. But too many people just let the weight fall or don't come down slow enough. And the benefits of that is it's like throwing away muscle building and strength building potential. Like you're literally just wasting that energy and time and effort and all that stuff. So care about the eccentric. It's range of motion, eccentric speed. And then after that, it's probably like a bunch of other stuff. But like those two things make a huge difference. The other thing that a lot of people don't understand is that the stretch of the lift is the most muscle building portion of that lift. So if you're only going you know, like here, and I'm guilty of this, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but if you're only like going to here on a bench press instead of trying to get the deepest stretch that you can, then you're also throwing away lots of muscle building potential. So care about the eccentric, care about the downward motion, make it important to you to the point where you just throw your ego out and don't care about the weight. Like your weight should be determined by how slow you can go on a on the eccentric within reason. It doesn't need to be 10 seconds necessarily, but one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, press up. And then range of motion is second. And then your weight should be determined by that, right? Your weight and your set should be determined by that. So what I recommend doing is pick a weight that you know you could do like 15 reps of, go very slow on the way down, get full range of motion, and now see how many reps you can get. You'll probably drop at least five reps, which if you're doing a muscle building program, which puts you in like the eight to 10 rep range, that's perfect. That's the weight you should use. So the weight that you used is determined by those factors, not let's pick a weight first, see if we can do 10 reps, and then change it from there. I think it's much better to have those priorities. So eccentric load needs to be slow, full range of motion, and then you need to hit your rep range based on what you're doing. How you how those things figure in is what your weight should be. So again, ego lifting, throw that out the window. All right, I'm really impressed by just how much of a deep stretch I get with this exercise. I'm really stoked. I'm gonna tell all my girlfriends about it. One, two, three, five, six, eight, nine. Oh God, I felt that more in my triceps that time and I'm not exactly sure why. What am I gonna do for back? Should I do chin-ups? I really don't wanna do chin-ups. I don't wanna do pull-ups at all. I don't wanna do any of that shit. No, but I should, definitely should. I feel like those guillotines really open up my chest too. By the way, if you're doing a guillotine press and you're afraid of the bar ending your life, then do it with dumbbells and just, you can also lower, no wait, how does it? How does it work? Yeah, you can lower this way and then turn in and press like that if you want, but yeah. Or I guess you could do it the other way. You could lower in slow and then flare your elbows out and then press. I don't know, I'm still learning about the best way to do the move, so whatever. I need some ugua. Ow, what the fuck was that? Why did something just stab me? Was it you, Golden? Was it you, Aria Gold? Did you try to stab me? You got schmutz on your eyes. The amount of sodium I had this weekend is really making this morning's pump freaking on point. Okay, last set. One, two, three, four, six, eight. Okay, I wasn't gonna do any more of that. Where did my water go? You know what, I really wanna do more of these guillotine presses, so we're gonna do one more set. One. want to call it. I was not at all confident in that last rep. And here's how I decided that. It was my last set. Fatigue is at its all time high. And I'm doing a guillotine press that's going towards my throat. So the risk to reward ratio, very risky. Just racked it. I understand pushing yourself to failure is important in certain situations. And that's how you build muscle and you want to, you know, push yourself to that limit. This is not a good example of that. You have to weigh all the safety versus risk factors. So if you're gonna go hard, go hard on the safest lifts. One of my favorite things to do if I'm gonna go hard and I'm in a gym setting is I go to failure on machines. I don't do it with things that are getting near my throat or areas where I might get severely injured and then I'm out of the gym and then I'm really not pushing myself. So a little reminder on why safety is important. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it literally means the difference between you staying consistent and you not staying consistent. So fine line between pushing yourself and hurting yourself. Okay. 
I'm a big proponent of fasting, and there's no better day to fast than after Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> like, I still feel like I just ate. Like, that's how full I feel. So I won't be hungry for breakfast. But I've become less fanboyish of fasting, probably in the last two years. I mean, I think it's great, and it definitely makes a big difference for me, but I feel it's like it's more of a tool than a routine for lots of people. Like, I think it can be used effectively, but I don't necessarily think that fasting every single day, and when I say fasting, by the way, because there's like 40 different ways to do it, I'm talking about your traditional intermittent fasting. You know, you're like 16, eight is what they call it. So 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. And I don't mean eight hours of eating, like you're eating the whole time. I just mean that's your window. And that's where it can get dangerous, like the whole window thing. For a lot of people, it's not a good mindset to have. I think the reason why I like it so much is that it naturally sort of works with my hunger cues. Like I typically don't get hungry until lunch. I eat at lunch and then I get hungry again at dinner. I eat at dinner and then you just move on. Like, but there are definitely days where I'm like hungry right after my workout. And I'm like, okay, protein shake, boom, let's go. You know, so it's one of those things where I think it's better to use it as a tool, but not to be married to it. Because if you're married to it, you get, you start pushing things outside of what you would normally do. And then you can get into dangerous territory. So everything's an ebb and flow. How you eat should be determined by your body, not by, you know, some, some somebody's rule for things. Just because your ancestors took, you know, 16 hours to find food doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing. Like I get the whole argument, but it's like, it's not, it's not that serious. All right, hey, we're doing bent over rows now. Where's my green guy? Is he right above yellow? Yeah. All right, okay, that's not happening. These little road microphones are so handy. The little clippies, very handy. Make sure it's really in there. Okay, 27 minutes, all right, not bad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stretch my back felt good. Not at first, but it started to feel good. This is the best part of doing bent over rows. You know, I think it's probably good that I'm not doing pull ups today because I'm at least like five pounds heavier from all the food and water retention because of the sodium, I wouldn't have gotten any high quality reps. Maybe I'll do some after this, like after I've gotten this in. I don't know, we'll see. I think it's still good to do them, but yeah, I just hate doing them. They feel so, they're always so defeating, for me anyway. I've never been a good, and when I say good, I'm mean, like, I've never been an impressive pull-up person. Like, you know, you see guys in the military just pumping them out. I think the most I've ever done is 15. And that was when I was doing this like super serious workout program, very regimen, like I loved it. But I was also, I think I weighed like 163. So I was 12 pounds lighter than I am now. And even being five pounds lighter for your pull-ups is amazing. Like the amount of more pull-ups I could do because I had dropped weight. And some of it was fat, like definitely. Like if I look at my body now and I like feel around, I'm like, yeah. I might be 175, which is where I like sit pretty comfortably now that I've, you know, kind of hit a, I wouldn't say a plateau, but I'm not serious about building muscle anymore. And I'm not doing a calorie deficit. So 175 is where I sit now with this, with this body type. Being 163, like... I remember running and feeling good. I was just lighter, right? So anyway, pulling ups, doing pull ups when you're lighter is it feels like you're just th throwing yourself over the bar. It's a good feeling. And that's the kind of stuff that I, I really like to reminisce about, like the journey and some of the things that I sort of accomplished without trying. Like it was never my goal to be so light that I would do pull ups and I would like do you know, like 15 of them. But it's one of the things I remember the most. So that's the stuff about like setting goals that I've never really been an, an I've never really enjoyed setting goals. Like instinctually, I've never enjoyed setting goals. And now the, the more that I learn about some of the psychological downsides of, of having goals and not viewing them correctly, I think that's probably maybe where I got lucky is that I've always been more interested in, in starting the journey and, and being a part of the journey than I am about being after some sort of destination. And I started working out because I was unhappy. Like I started working out, I shouldn't say that. When I was a junior in high school, I quit the baseball team because my coach was an asshole. I was tired of playing for people that just, it wasn't fun anymore. And I liked baseball because it was fun. I mean, it's pretty basic, right? So my dad said, well, you got to still be physically active because it's good for you. I said, okay. And so I started trying to work out on my own. And then he got me into going to the gym and working out. And my grandfather, his dad, got me really into like teen bodybuilding. Like he sent me a bunch of bodybuilding.com stuff. I joined the forum. Like that was some fun memories. I started taking protein powders and my grandfather told me about creatine. And so anyway, there's like all these things that the journey was really always the most enjoyable, most memorable thing. And I also was a pretty unhappy kid in high school. Very, very low self-esteem. 
I had terrible uh, cystic acne. If I can find some photos, I'll, I'll put it on the screen. And just super unconfident, super unhappy, very depressed all the time. And lifting weights and exercising while I was still depressed, it, it sort of gave me a reason and an outlet for a lot of that negative energy instead of just sitting in it and wallowing in it. And uh, over time, I started to learn how to become more mentally tough, going through things that were very tough, like mentally for me, as well as being tough in the gym and having to force yourself to work out and, and things like that. So, so yeah, the journey has always been, I learned very early on that the journey is really what you're after. It's not the results. And so I stopped setting goals for myself. I know that sounds terrible probably to most people. And they're like, dude, you don't have any goals in your life? I was like, I mean, yeah, I have goals, but all I have to do is think about them. I don't need to like write them down and be like, I want to do this when I'm, before I'm 12, you know, or before I'm, you know, 45 or whatever. So, all right, back to the rows. One of the biggest limiting factors for bent over rows is just your back stamina and like, you know, your ability to stay in that position. I don't really consider it a good exercise to go to really try to like push it because you're gonna fatigue a lot faster having to hold the position. Whereas if you were doing like a seated cable row, your stability is all, all anchored in, you know? So it's better to kind of really push it on those. I, I don't feel like I get a tremendously good pump from bent over rows because the fatigue factor of staying in that position, and I know I'm out of shape, so like that's part of it, but the fatigue factor of staying in that position is so much higher than like sitting and rowing or sitting and pulling. So if I was doing like a dedicated back day or like a dedicated chest back day, I probably wouldn't do a ton of those, you know, like bent over rows because you have to think about it. Like you're given, you're going to be given a certain amount of energy for your workout and that's going to differ per person. But, you know, provided you're not taking any sort of stimulants that help prolong your workout just to keep the variables at a minimum, you want to try to do, if you're isolating and you're not just focusing on a full body thing, if you're isolating chest, isolating back, you want to focus on exercises that reduce the amount of fatigue that isn't local to the actual move you're trying to do. So if I'm doing a bent over row, I'm getting fatigued by the positioning, which means that it's going to affect my ability to do as many reps as I can doing the bent over row. Now that fatigue is a benefit for full body, you know, conditioning, be it, you know, smaller, like just because I'm doing bent over rows doesn't mean I'm going to be in better shape. But in terms of it being a more holistic exercise and more holistic conditioning, it will be. But that's not the purpose of my workout today. My focus is chest and back, not a full body workout. So you have to you have to have parameters in order to make these make sense. But yeah, that's what I would do. So anyway, I don't even know why I went on that topic. Oh, because I was fatiguing sooner than yeah. So I, I said that because I was fatiguing sooner than my back was fatiguing. And so if you notice that your body positioning is affecting the fatigue of an exercise and you're not getting the fatigue from the muscle that group that you're trying to work, then that's when you have, you need to kind of reevaluate what you're doing. But most people, like if you're watching this and you're just trying to get back to the gym, that stuff is in the future. Like just focus on doing things as properly as you can, getting the swing of things, getting familiar with exercises, making mind muscle connections so you understand, you know, how things are supposed to feel, where you're supposed to feel it. And then once you get a little bit better at that, then it's like, okay, now I need to actually isolate chest and back or whatever muscle group you're working. That being said, I do feel like I'm getting, I got like a good pump from those guillotine presses, which is awesome. I was influenced pretty early on that uh, you only needed to go to about 90 degrees on a chest press in order to activate the chest, which is kind of a misleading buzzword because activating the chest doesn't really tell you if it's maximizing or optimizing the stretch. And so I was influenced by things early on that weren't necessarily right. And I haven't really updated my information, but this weekend I did, and I'm glad I did because now I know who to listen to. There's two people, Mike Isretel and Jeff Nippert. I don't know why I forgot Jeff Nippert's name. I knew him before Mike Isretel. I think it's because I spent so much time saying Mike Isretel so I could remember how to say his name because I, when I first looked at him, I'm like, what? Mike Isretel also reminds me of that guy from Mike Tyson's Boxing who's from Turkey. I forget his name, but he looks a lot like that guy. Oh, Soda Popinski. He reminds me a lot of Soda Popinski. Like I should put a side by side of their photos. I don't know. That's just me. All right. Next, I actually have almost an equal pump in my hamstrings from the stretch of doing these as I do in my back. That's that'll tell you something. Okay. How are we doing on on recording time? Oh, we're we're doing amazing. You know what's really nice? Not using 4K on this camera. I would have wouldn't even be able to do 15 minutes. 4K is so overrated. Like I really don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. I'm sure it does like in the numbers, but 4K is like visually makes no difference to me. It's the size of your camera sensor that matters. One. Three, four, five, six, 
7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh. Yeah, my low back fatigue's way faster on those than I feel like it should. I don't really feel that much of a back pump. I feel a low back pump, and that's not what I'm going for. I also just genuinely feel fatigued. I don't think I've ever had food poisoning that bad before. Like, I feel like someone just drained every good form of bacteria or cell out of my body. I feel like, like the same way that a vampire drains you know, somebody of their blood, I feel like somebody just like literally just drained me. And it makes sense. I was vomiting violently and I had diarrhea. And most of the time they alternated with like a five second gap in between each other. I'm sorry for the TMI, but like, I have to describe that to you for you to understand that my body was just depleted. And I remember I couldn't even keep Pedialyte down. And then finally after hour six, I was able to actually drink Pedialyte. And then I think it was like hour eight or nine, my wife was like, hey, you need to eat. And I'm like, I can't even think of food. And she was like, eat some toast. And I was like, I can't even think of toast. I'm like, I'm trying to listen to my body. She's like, no. Every time you say that, it ends up getting worse. Just go eat some toast. If you vomit, you vomit. Like what's the worst case that could happen? She was right. So I ate some toast, I kept it down, and then it was smooth sailing for keeping food down from then on out. But the days leaving, leading after it, I was just like, I just felt like, I didn't mentally feel like a zombie. I, my body just felt like, dude, what? we have nothing in us. And it makes sense, right? Because like if I'm vomiting, I'm vomiting the stuff that I ate in the last eight hours plus very minimal eating the next day. Like I think I maybe had 400 calories the whole day. Yeah, it was just, and then I didn't eat breakfast the, the next day. So yeah, it was just, it was bad. Yesterday around, I'd say noon was the first part of the day that I actually felt normal. Like my stomach felt normal. Like I was still battling like nausea. Yeah, up until yesterday around noon. And there are times like in the morning where I feel nauseous, you know, like especially if I'm working out on an empty stomach, like I'll feel a little nauseous, but it goes away maybe like three minutes. This was just like a, like a ebb and flow of just nauseous feelings. But yeah, kefir, if you ever wanna get your gut bacteria right and you can tolerate dairy for the most part, like at least a little bit of dairy, I would get some kefir. Kefir is a godsend for your gut bacteria. Like it is amazing. And it's not just good for the gut bacteria you have, it's good for replenishing and increasing your good gut bacteria. And a lot of people think gut bacteria and like gut microbiome science is like fringe stuff, but um, your gut literally is, it was your first real brain, right? Cause your gut has been around longer than the frontal lobe of your brain. So, you know, when people say it's a gut instinct, that's what used to keep us alive, right? If you're walking down the street and it feels like someone's, you know, looking at you or walking behind you, but you can't hear them and you turn around, and there's somebody there, that's a gut feeling. That stuff isn't just pseudoscience, it's real. So to care about what your gut population looks like and how your gut health is, I think should be up there with, you know, everything else, you know, macronutrients, you know, protein intake. Like the problem is, is that most people don't really understand how important it is because it's kind of like, oh, I know exercise is important, but until I feel it, I'm probably not going to care about it. It's the same way with gut health. Like until you have better gut health, you don't really care about it because you're like, what could really be that much better? So that's all I'll say. I really don't care about trying to force people into ideas anymore. I'm more interested in spreading information. When I was a coach, I think I got a little too into trying to force and convince people of things because my livelihood depended on it. And I kind of had to in order to make money. Now that I'm not reliant on, on fitness as a career for making, you know, make money and stuff, I enjoy it so much more. Like, I think one of the best things to happen to me is to get out of professional coaching because it turned me into somebody who I wouldn't say things so I could get business, but I turned into a different kind of person and I lost my enjoyment of the career. So now that I can just say things and and spread awareness and encourage people to do things versus trying to convince them, it's so much more fun. And I feel like it's probably gonna have more benefit to you because you're just gonna be listening to and going, this guy has no objective. He doesn't make money off of this. He's not trying to get me into his coaching program. He's not trying to force me into an email list. Yeah, and I'm not saying that stuff's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying, you know, for me, I'm so hyper aware of people that are trying to get me into some sort of coaching with them or trying to solicit me into their their thing. And it's just like, whether it's coaching or if it's like, oh God, I get so many people are like, hey, I want to be your video editor. It's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't need a video editor. I am a video editor. Like I, I can do all that stuff myself. Yeah, but then you can scale your business because somebody else is doing your stuff. What business? Do you see a business here? I don't have a business. 
I'm doing this for fun. This is fun. I edit my own content because it's fun. It's not a chore. It's fun. So I tried Meta Verified just to see what it was all about, and it's totally not worth it unless you're a professional and it somehow, I don't know, works for you. But I did it for a month, and it was the worst $15 I've ever spent. It was cool, though. Like, it was always cool to see that little check by my name, but it doesn't mean anything anymore when you can buy it. I'm looking at my analytics for the last month. I've reached 7,334 accounts, which is 204% more than I was reaching before, considering I wasn't doing anything before. I'm not really surprised by that. And counts, uh, accounts engaged, 385, which is 134% more than usual. Again, wasn't posting anything to this account. This next number is my favorite. Total new followers, negative uh, 0.6%. So I've actually lost 15, no, 25 followers since I started posting more content, which is a good thing. Like, I'm totally up for that because it basically means that there were people following me that didn't want to see my content. So get the fuck out. Uh, content you shared. Yeah, that's not that big a deal. Yeah. So anyway, fun stuff. All right. I guess we could do some band stuff. Finish things up for today. Maybe some lateral raises for the shoulders. Um, is this is Thursday. No. Three. All right. One, two. My stomach is starting to feel it. Meaning that like, I didn't eat very good yesterday, so my tolerance for fatigue is super low because my nutrition is dog shit yesterday and the day before that. I had pizza two days in a row and I didn't eat a lot of pizza. I just you know, had like two slices each day, but I don't think people realize that when you eat food that isn't nutritious, your cells are basically, it's like, you know, pretend that you just put like banana peels in your car instead of gas. Like, how do you think it's gonna run? right? That's, that's the way it is for me anyway. I don't know. There were times I remember in high school, like I would, I didn't eat the best, but my workouts were like awesome. But that was uh, 17 years ago. No. Yeah. About 17, 18 years ago. So my body's changed a lot. <laughs> I had a lot more abuse. That's not happening right now. Hopefully my mic's still working. No, good it is. My camera's dying though. Makes sense though. It's been on for 53 minutes, so I'll take it. I will take it. You know, that's one thing about making content that, that I'm sure most viewers don't realize, making sure your camera's always charged. I really should get a second battery now that I'm recording much longer single takes. I should get a second battery so that between takes, I can just pop it in really quick. All right, next set. Eight, five. It's only 5.30. I thought it was six. Hell yeah. All right, I think that's where I'm gonna call it for today. By the time you see this, it won't be Monday. I was gonna say happy Monday. One thing I'll say, if you got this far in the video, I'm deeply appreciative of you watching this content. I don't do this for the views. I don't do this for the likes, the YouTube subscribers. I do it for fun. But if I can help people along the way, even better. So, all right, I'll see you later.